Hi, I'm Eric Ostro, host of Live at the Lord Town. For season four, we continue our focus on art and activism. Why do off-Broadway artists uplift certain causes, and how do those causes make them the artists they are today? And while we gather virtually, we'd like to recognize that we occupy land stolen from indigenous people. Join us in acknowledging this history and consider our role in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Eric Ostro, one of the hosts of Live at the Lortel. Um, to start off, uh, I'm a Caucasian male with a beard that should be trimmed. Uh, I'm wearing a black sweater and a navy blue cap. Uh, my pronouns are his and him. I'm very, very excited uh, for our guests this evening. I've been a very big fan of this artist for a long time. Robin DeJesus is a three-time Tony Award-nominated actor. Most recently, Robin joined the cast of Hulu's Welcome to the Chippendales as Ray Colon. Um, he can currently be seen in the Netflix adaptation of Tick, Tick, Boom, directed by his dear friend and I'm assuming family member, Lynn manuel Miranda. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome my very talented artist, Robin DeJesus. Robin. What up? What up? I wanted to do, I had like a two page bio, but I thought that would take so long. But I got to say from my heart, I'm such a big fan. I mean, I, I'm, you were always at the top of the list when we were going over artists that we wanted to have on the show. And I'm so grateful that we finally got you here. Thank um, you. And your work over this past year has just been stellar in everything I've seen you and you're just a magnificent, beautiful artist. Uh, I, I will. Blushing. Okay. All right. Thank I'll, you. I'll start. I'll stop gushing. Um, no, no, thank you. It, it, oh, it, it, going, yeah. it is a privilege to be an artist. So it's always an interesting dynamic when, when people are, are affirming whatever goodness happens in your life. And, mm. and sometimes some days it's easier to receive and some days ego shows up and tries to disrupt <laughs> it. So I want to take that in and say, thank you. My pleasure. I think a lot of people feel the same way I do. You know, I like to kind of start at what you're currently working on or what you just finished, which was Welcome to Chippendales. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, about the show, or if you're not allowed to talk about it, I mean, you might have signed your life away and you're not allowed to talk about it, but I, I would love to know, you know, um, how you got involved in this project. And I mean, I know Chippendales, uh, but I'd love to hear a little bit about it. Yeah, of course. I, I can give away a little bit because the story's been documented so much that I right. feel like there's a significant, a significant amount of the plot is kind of already out there in the world. Um, Welcome to Chippendales is the story. It's a mini series on Hulu, and it tells the story of the two men who created the Chippendales. There's the man um, who... Uh, who sort of came, had the idea, provided the venue, he had the money, kind of couldn't really figure out like how creatively to execute it, but was trying. And then you have another man who uh, basically, he was a choreographer, an, an Emmy award winning choreographer who came in, Murray Bartlett's playing him. And um, this particular man, uh, I forget Nick's last name now, but he kind of polished the show up. He sort of gave it that thing that made it really easy to sell. Um, and, and they sort of bickered over who, who owned Chippendales more than the other. I am the best friend to Kumail Nanjiani, who plays Mr. Banerjee, the guy who owned the venue and came up with the idea and the concept. And I'm kind of his hype man, you know, um, I'm his hype man. I also do lots of things. I, my character moved to LA to work in the music industry. Mm -hmm. He's from the Bronx, he's Bronx Italian, Bronx, Puerto Rican, Italian dude working okay. class background, who came to LA wanting to work in the music industry, eventually also wrote screenplays, would do like carpentry on the side, would do plumbing on the side. He was a photographer. He was basically Dolly Levi. <laughs> and he had all these cars he Just leave out. everything to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I kind of, me and Kumail's character, Mr. Banerjee, have this one very specific incident that ties us. That is a big part of the plot, especially towards the end of the series. So how many episodes is it? There's eight. There are eight episodes. Yeah. And it begins when? November 22nd on Hulu. Although I will say this, I don't come until 
I'm not in the first episode. Let's put it that way. Okay. All right. So, so I won't watch the first episode, but I'll catch up on. You start on two, right? I start on three. <laughs> oh, you start on three. Okay, even better. But it, it's um, I mean, it's an exciting thing. I mean, to work on a new project and and a new script. Um, it's super exciting. The script is so delicious. You know, Murray Bartley, Kumail Nanjiani, Annalie Ashford, Juliet Lewis, y'all. Annalie Ashford, you got me there, right? Yeah. Oh, and Anna's great. And unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of stuff with the women, but I, I did get to see Juliet Lewis a lot and fawn over her and stuff. And I'm excited too because for me, character wise, it's, it's it's different. I think than what most people have seen me do, mm -hmm. uh, especially later on in the series. So kind of excited to just disrupt whatever the typecasting's been going on for a minute. I like the way you shake your head and you really <laughs> glow when you talk about this series. It's, it, sounds, it sounds like it was a, a great experience. It was really fun and I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it. I feel like the last few years um, there's been more joy in my work and I didn't realize for a long time that it, it, it had been missing. Um, so now I just, I feel like when I talk about work, if I light up, it's just because... Um, I have a better arrangement with it in your in your mind so sort of like your heart caught up to your mind and what do you mean by like were there a couple of years where you were i mean we could talk about this later yeah. but that you felt like throwing in the towel or you felt like you were being typecast or all of the above and a lot of it a lot of it clarified itself during the the tick tick boom period it was it was in that in that period between boys in the band and tick tick boom where uh, a lot of my demons kind of became very clear and I could actually name them wow. to figure out how to, you know, resist. Uh, I could tell you part of it now or I could wait till you get to Tick Tick. No, I feel like honey, please. I, I would love, I mean, I, I want to talk about Tick Tick Boom in a minute, yeah. but now that we're on it, please talk about it. I mean, I think Absolutely. we have a lot of students and, and young artists that listen to this. So I think it's really important. Perfect. So when I was younger, there's, I performed for the joy. It, 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 I vibrated. I, I, I healed. You know, my best friend, Dominic Colon, who I'm sure will come up several times in this convo. Um, he's my best friend, my non-sexual life partner. He's an amazing writer, actor. We work a lot together. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Dominic said recently, he won, Danye R. Love and Billy Porter started, I forgot the name of, of, um, of the award, but it's a, it's an award for HIV positive playwrights writing stories about HIV. Um, and so Dominic won the award and Dominic said he came to playwriting as a healer. And, and that was the first time that I'd ever really heard it phrased that way, maybe from someone that I know so, so mm -hmm. well. And so I came to the arts because I was a, an outsider. And when I came to the arts, I suddenly, felt like I was a part of another community outside of my family. I discovered my creativity. I, I developed confidence and that was really the healing aspect of, of, of the arts. And as, I've and as I continued in the business, I think what sort of happened was the more successful I got, the more heady I got. Mm. And the fact that I never really understood systemically in me, I performed because of the joy and the release and, and the need, <laughs> the need to perform. Yeah. Over the years, I didn't realize that that like commercial theater got in my head and it was a, it became a job. And, and then there was like a game to play and and um, all the red know, tape, all the politics, all the Michigas that goes on with it. Yeah. Yeah, and also the acceptance of the modeling in, in the sense of like. A lot of actors go into auditions feeling like, oh, I'm a beggar and this is the person mm -hmm. offering. And so I'm less than and there's a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I come in with this, this energy of despair. And I think that in my late 20s, I learned despair more and more. And, and working became too serious. And everything mattered to the point where I was creating from a, a, like, a tight body. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, and a tight spirit. Yeah. And acting is so, creativity is so intuitive. Mm -hmm. And when you're like this, you can't receive the, the messages. Um, during Boys in the Band, you know, it got bad. And I, I got pre-panicky. I got panicky, but, but by tick, tick, boom, it was like mini panic attacks. And with boys, it was the awareness of like, these men have these crazy careers and I'm trying to make moves and I want to do more. And I know that I'm fierce 
And mm -hmm. I know that I'm just not aligning with opportunity like so many of my peers. I see. And in that, and in that room, I knew that there was opportunity. And I freaked. And my ego became louder than my love. And, wow. and so I was in a place of consistent fear. And, and Emery took me forever to find like it. Really? I didn't find that character till the day before first previews. Yes. Really? I, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm in shock. I mean, I, I'm so glad you're talking about this because I think it's something that a lot of artists don't talk about. Um, demons always being in your head, being so tight that you're not able to create. Is, am I getting that right? Hundred per hundred percent. It's it's doubt. It's 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 mm. lack of faith. It's it's not operating from a um a loving space. And mm. and for me, that's always what it's been about. You know, I I think about like Patty Lupone. She said once, I think in her memoir, she said something about that when she performs, she never wants the audience to feel scared for her because it should always be her as a performer taking care of them. And, you know, I've I always had nerves, but it got progressively worse. And there was a period where I felt like I, I couldn't be the caretaker of, of, of the audience for a bit because I wasn't, you know, in my power. And I didn't know what that was. Uh, by, by Boys in the Band previews, I found Emery the night before. And even all through previews, I go through the show and think, I don't really know what I did. So <laughs> like, is like, it... Like, Go ahead, please. No. Did well, you feel was, like you were blacking, you you blacked out and just were on automatic no. pilot or like like I was doing the act. I was very aware of, of Emery's of his backstory. I was very aware of what he was going through. I was very aware. I I had everything mapped out the way I do with every character, and then I'd get to the show and I'd throw it away. Mm -hmm. But the the route was always the same in each performance. I would always do what I what I what I what I planned to do, but the outcome I don't know why I I couldn't gauge it. I'm usually really good at gauging how the show is going, the relationship with the audience, and with that show it was a bit more of a mystery, and and I think that's because my ego was was just like disrupting things. And then by the film, I remember getting to a point of insecure. I was I was. I thought I was getting better. And Jim Parsons when I were talking one day after a take because I realized, oh man, that's what the scene was. It wasn't that for this version of, of Boys in the Band. And I, I can't go back, it's, it's done. And he said, you know, Robin, it's okay to learn, to learn on the job. Robin, it's okay to learn on the job. Robin, it's okay to learn on the job. And there was something about that that was very, um, demystifying and very humbling Free. and very um oh that's right like i i know that we want to make this work and when we talk about film we go you do it and it's there forever but we're also always ever growing <laughs> yeah. we have a right to and uh -huh. and as artists sometimes we feel like everything's got to be perfect absolutely perfect but we don't really know what that is and, and so I just like, I really meditated on that for a while and I knew he was right. And there, there was, I did feel like I could let go of whatever was happening. And I also had the privilege of working with, you know, Mark Crowley's script and, and, and working with Joe Mantello, who I knew wouldn't steer me in the wrong direction. So that mm -hmm. also helped. But Tick Tick was the one where I really started freaking out. And there were moments where certain days I was so chill and having the best time with Lynn. That's my boy. I felt so safe. And then there were other days where a voice would go, you're, you're pretending. Everyone mm -hmm. sees you. You're not the real thing. Everyone, you just got this job because like everyone thinks you got this job because Lynn's your friend or whatever that thing was. And then it'd go, I, I'd be on set and I think none of the crew is looking at me because I'm that terrible. I'm that terrible, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> that they can't even associate themselves with. But Lynn would look at me sometimes. He'd say, no, Robin, I got this in this take. I got this. I just want this now. And he'd just kind of cock his head like, what are you going through? And then he'd play scenes for me. And I'd realize they weren't bad. They right. weren't. They didn't have the specificity that I wanted for the story and for my character. But but like it, it was making sense. I was just really, really wigging. 
to, to the end to this is that one specific day, it was the day they announced that Biden had won the election. It's a beautiful sunny day. And I was supposed to shoot a scene where I was driving a car down the West Side Highway with, with Andrew Garfield. And originally we were gonna shoot it outside because of the pandemic, we ended up shooting on a sound stage with a, like a blue screen. And to me, a blue screen was the perfect storm for me to look like a bad actor driving in a car. <laughs> And I start wigging, beads of sweat. I look, I, I, I look crazy. And Lynn looks at me like, kind of like, bro, what's, what's up with you? And I knew in the way he said it, because it was love, that it was me. And I went to my trailer and I saw the announcement. Everyone was screaming because Biden won. And then I saw Van Jones on CNN crying about the proximity of the election. And what that meant about the state that we're in as a country, specifically with, with, with race relations. And I looked at the TV and said, now that matters. Now that's real. But me, Robin de Jesus, the son of migrant workers from Puerto Rico who didn't have the privilege of finishing middle school and high school and had to work in factories. And in, in one generation, I'm number two on the call sheet for a Netflix movie starring Andrew Garfield, written by Steven Levinson and obviously Jonathan Larson and directed by Lin-Manuel. Like, what are you doing? You're creating drama. You are choosing this shit. And, and that just, I saw my ego and I saw who I really was and, and, and the love that I am and that I try to work with and be and multiply. And I realized that this had been louder. And something about that just made sense. And after that happened, my ego got quieter. I had way more fun. The work got way better. And I could feel presence. Because to me, theater is spiritual. It, yeah. is, a, it, is, it, is, a, it is a divine experience. And it is a connection. 100%. Yeah. And, and after that, I physically felt it. You literally, you got out of your head. I mean, whether it was the, the knock in the head that you got that Biden won and you noticed, okay, that is real. I got to get out of my head to make sure that, you know, working across Garfield is a give and take, is a listen and respond, is a being yeah, a live and, liar. And, but, and also, all of these things I'm feeling are in fact choices. Yeah. I chose to be anxious. Right. I chose. Now, granted, I don't always see the the, the reason I chose anxiety. I don't always see the choices before me, I should say, the, the anxious route, the non-anxious route. And sometimes that anxiety is related to other structural systemic issues as, as well. It's not all me. But I'm I was addressing the work that only I can control, my contribution. And, and in that moment, I saw, whoa, this, this freak out I'm having is nowhere near as important as that thing. So whatever this state is, it's almost, it is, not almost, it's disrespectful to the art that I'm trying to create. <sighs> because, so you perfectly. know, yeah. we're, we're, the art is about freedom. It's about liberation. Right. And I'm over here operating as if I was in a cell. <laughs> yeah. And I'm my own liberator. I'm my own abolitionist, you know? So it kind of happened in a split second. You were able to, to get within your body, get out of your head and start to have fun. I mean, I, I, I don't want to... It, it did happen in that moment, but the accumulation had been there for God, a couple understood. of years. And there understood. was something about that moment that just went, nope, nope. You're right. Whatever this this conclusion you're coming to, this absolutely affirms it. And now we're going to throw in faith. Wow. I love that. So Thanks. we can go back a little bit. I mean, for me, seeing you on screen, it's so interesting for you to talk about, you know, the fear and how insecure you felt. But, you know, I'm going to go back to that movie. You know which one I'm going to bring up, right? Camp? Yeah. <laughs> so... I love that movie. Um, you know, to me, it's like um, 
it's a camp that my parents wouldn't allow me to go to. And I wanted to go to, to that camp so bad. I ended up going to an all boys sports camp that, that did well. Anyway, the, um, what was it like working as an actor sort of coming in from, from out of nowhere? I mean, and, I did. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, you you came from nowhere and were so magnificently beautiful in that movie. Thank you. Thank what? you, because that yeah, period was a fascinating period, you know. Yeah, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear what what that was like to be kind of like shoved into the spotlight. And um, the arc is so beautiful for that character. It's mm. so, I mean, it, that, that movie stands up today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. If, if, if anything, Tick, Tick, Boom sort of made it pop into the zeitgeist a little bit for musical yeah, theater folks. Of course. Because I, I, I felt like during the press for Tick, Tick, we were getting the love that camp wasn't afforded back then. Right. So in some strange way, retroactively, it was giving that movie att the attention that it deserved as well. I mean, I was 17 when I got cast in that movie. It was literally my first acting audition, professional yeah. acting audition ever. I was in high school. I was, I was on my, no, I had just graduated high school. I was going to a state school to study classical music. I wanted to study musical theater, but I was told that I was too short and Puerto Rican and that musical theater wasn't accepting enough for a type like me and that I should study classical music and opera where no one cared what I looked like, verbatim. And so I, I listened to the elders because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. And my, my elders at home knew nothing about this business. They were just like, we want you to, to do what you love and make money. <laughs> right, and of course. I went to an open call for the for camp. It was during the same period. Um, it was the same season, the first season of, it was during the first season of American Idol. So everyone in America was watching cattle call auditions. You know, it was it, that was that was big in media. And yeah. then I go to my first audition, and that's what it was like. A cattle call. It was like 700 kids because the movie the actors were non-union even though the right. crew was union and so telsey's office was just trying to find non-conventional ways to cast folks went in sang 16 bars a cappella, dance got called back for the next day a week and a half later of like seven hour auditions with different folks being paired up i ended up booking the character and booking michael one of the leads and it was so it was just bizarre. My mom was moving back to Puerto Rico. She had held off on moving to Puerto Rico until I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. um, so then my mom moves to Puerto Rico. I'm 17. I'm on my own. I book yeah. this movie. I end up living with my siblings, you know, while I'm commuting. And, and it was just so beautiful and so empowering because I'd never been around kids who loved theater as much as I did in, in that same obsessive way. And we were all aware of like this exciting, weird indie film was happening that it was like, it was cool because we were making a movie, but also like we were told it was only going to be released in two cities. So it like was a real movie, but at the same time, it didn't really feel like it, You know, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Was there somebody on set that, I mean, so many of you were newbies, were they like, this is your mark, this is where you find your light. I mean, you literally came from, I mean, I know where you come from, but you... You well, they, I had no home. film background. I had no film background whatsoever. Todd right. Graff wrote and directed the film. He had been a child actor. He was the original. Um, he was in the original uh, uh, baby cast. He was opposite uh, Liz Calloway. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And 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 Todd had three weeks of rehearsal with us, where he drilled those scenes with us. I see. He, like we worked through them with a fine tooth comb, and. I, for me, I was learning how to camera act at the time. I I and and when I look at the movie. I didn't know how to act, but I knew that I was loving what I was doing and I understood the spirit of that film and the character. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that like that movie is it's it's rough around the edges, but it's it's full of so much heart yes. that I think the heart overshadows the sort of messiness of it. And so the <laughs> message is, is still very much de delivered when 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 we finished it, I remember just thinking to myself like, whoa, this is what it feels like to act. <laughs> I had never been afforded such such meaty scenes. Of course you haven't, yeah. 
and I was figuring out my sexuality and here's someone, you know, kind of just coming out of that. So it was, it was feeding me as well. It was, it was, it was very life imitating art. Very much. The, the parallels were right there. Yeah. I mean, we, can, I we can, we can see that in the performance. It's so, it's so raw and beautiful and um, maybe it is. I mean, I love that they cast somebody that didn't have a big background in in movies and theater or whatever. They cast somebody new because it, it it brought the newness to all of us. And that to me was so beautiful. Thank you. I think it's fascinating that, you know, we were a non-union film mm -hmm. um, and they figured out how to cast us. Yeah. But I bet if it was union, they would have complained and said they couldn't find us. It just, it, it, my point in that is yeah. just, it's really, really interesting that sometimes with casting, you know, there are excuses made for not being able to find certain talent. But when you don't give folks the financial means to find it somehow, I'm not saying I want less money, don't get me, but you no, know what I'm saying? It, because that, 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 that alignment for me maybe wouldn't have happened if the movie was union, was a union film. I understand. And I'm not anti-union by any means. No, I'm just, of course you're not. I'm just commenting on on something, commenting on something else. It's interesting. I mean, we could have a whole another hour talk about what's going on in the union and actors and artists, you know, withdrawing from the union. I mm. mean, it's um, it's fascinating to watch what's going on in the theater now, um, and how artists are reacting to the people that were supposed that are supposed to be behind them and just supposed to hold them up. And um, you know, there's you know, three sides to the coin here. There's so, there's so much in it. Incredible. So, so much in it. And also I, we're figuring things out. Like right. we've been figuring things out for a very, very long time, but this year so much. Um, last two years, right? Last two, the last two years, like yeah. certain causes have been able to get louder and cause more of a ruckus and people and people, some folks have been forced to listen as they, as they should. And so there are all these things coming up. And I, and I think in that we're all figuring out what the best route for us is. So, um, you know, when it comes to people dropping out of the union or coming in, I, I feel like I, I, I stay away from making a, a statement about how I personally feel. And you don't need I to just absolutely think it's supposed right. to be messy right now while we figure out what is in fact best. And That's some, right. No, and things will be fixed. I mean, I, I, you know, just like what's happening in the theater will be fixed. So I, I think we just need to give it time. Um, besides, um, your you started off Broadway with Lynn's In the Heights, with that incredible character. Um, you got to play Sonny. Um, how did the relationship between you and Lynn begin? Also, side note, Sonny's literally the character I love more than any character I've ever played. Um, he, to this day, he's my absolute favorite. That relationship with me and Lynn started with me asking him if he wanted to make out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even joking because it was so inappropriate. I was, I was 20 years old and trying to be really provocative. And it was a funny joke with my friends. <laughs> And I never met Lynn. I just read his name. In, I, I never got to read the script for the show. So I, I didn't even like, I didn't fawn over him because I didn't really know you how didn't brilliant. You know what to fawn over, yeah. Yeah, but I was like excited to meet him. Sure. And, and when he introduced himself, he goes, hey, I'm Ali Manuel. And I was like, yo, what up? It's Robin. Want to make out? And I literally leaned in with a tongue <laughs> out and like eyes all busted looking and stuff. And he was like, he took a beat, like he was like weirded out, and then he burst into laughter. Like he was like, "Oh, this guy's a clown." Okay. Um, and so we were after that. It was just, I don't even think we made any extra effort to to like connect more with one another because we weren't allowed to read the script before getting to the O'Neill. The O'Neill Theater Center was was uh, where I did my first reading of In the Heights, and. Because we didn't get to read the, the script beforehand, the, the, the table read, the first cold read was the first time I ever heard the script, knew the plot, anything about it, really. And what I remember most was that Sonny vomited out of my mouth. Like, 
I was cold reading, but I knew who that dude was. Uh, he was my brother, if anything. I felt my brother flow through me and, and sort of just like the cadence of the way he spoke. And, and in that, it was just sort of like me and Lynn just fell into place and it just happened really, really organically to the point where when, when the two weeks were done, Tommy Kale, the director turns to me, he goes, hey, Robin. I go, yeah, he goes, let's do this again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, word. Okay, I, think, good. Yeah. I think they like me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can so see that on stage. I mean, you can see the relationship um, was so easy. Mm. Um, you know, you guys were, you kind of played brothers on stage. I mean, he, you looked up to him and he we were, we were helped take care we of like you. Brothers. Yeah. We played cousins, but we were more like brothers. Right. That's what I'm saying. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, you looked up to him. You, um, he was your, your person, the person that he, helped take care of you. He was my father he, figure. Yeah. Mike, if you notice, you know, Sonny never, there's no mention of a mother, of a no. father. Uh, mm -hmm. So you definitely feel like he's being raised by the community. And and obviously the, the movie gives away a little more to the, the background story of, of, of Sonny or Sonny's background. Um, but for, for us, it, it, it always felt to me like the relationship between Sonny and Usnavi was about survival. Mm. And, and that there was a deep, passionate love because Sonny did know that his life would not be in the place that it was in without Sonny, without Usnavi. Because the thing about Sonny is Sonny's really smart. He was, he's, he's never been dumb. He's funny, but he's not dumb. If Dylan would always say Sonny's the most honest character on that stage, he's the only one actually saying what he feels and speaking truth in, 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 in that script, you know? And uh, with Lynn, it was also, you know, Lynn's a freestyle rapper. So when you do new stuff, he goes with it. And I had a tendency in that show to never really repeat the same show. Uh, no. <laughs> it was always pretty different to the point where Tommy would say to me, like, what, you can't do the same show twice? You can't have <laughs> it, it, do I you didn't... love that? Is that something that you love just to kind of every night change it up just a little bit? Yes, 100%. Otherwise, what's the point of doing theater? Like, I completely agree. It's, all, it's going to be different whether you intend for it to be different or not. Right. And I am, an, I, I am an intuitive artist. I There is an exchange happening with you and everyone on stage and everyone backstage, backstage and everyone in the audience. And every day, you know, the ratios of everything are a little different than they were on the other day. And so you sort of have to react to that. And sometimes you go, okay, there's another energy coming in, but it's actually not conducive to the story. So my job today is to block whatever that thing is and make sure I route the story so it stays on track That's for my character. Yeah, understood, yeah. And with, and with Lynn, whenever I played around, Lynn would run with it, he run with it. it. Yeah, it would always, it would just like top off, you know? Uh, and that was just so so much fun to be, to be around. And um, I'm kind of- That's about trust, I mean, it's- to trust another actor so much that they live not only in your head on stage with the lines you got to get out, your intentions, your objectives, et cetera. But um, when you trust someone so much in the, in your heart, your heart to heart, that it, it just, and there are reasons why I should not trust him. There are reasons reason. why I should not trust him. I will say, although the reason I say this is because there were, I think three occasions towards the end of Lynn's run with the show. No, it was two occasions. Mm -hmm. Where when I would come into that scene before Champagne, uh, where for whatever reason, my first line was state your purpose. And then he'd say something. And I, my next line was, oh, was this my severance package or, or something like that when he gives Sonny the money? Right. And twice I could not remember that line. I said, I would come in and go, what's your, uh, state your purpose with all this energy. And then he'd say his line and mine is next. And I would just go. <laughs> and instead of helping me, do you know what Lynn would do? Uh -uh. He'd turn to me and he'd go. <laughs> As if to say, oh, I'm not helping you at all. I'm gonna this watch is on you, you right now. I'm going to watch you. And, and even that 
felt so safe. Yeah. You saw it. I mean, you see that. You don't, you can't make things up like that when you see that relationship on stage. I mean, not only with, with you and, and Lynn's character, but the whole cast seemed to just fit perfectly like the perfect jigsaw puzzle. Everybody seemed to trust everybody and know what everybody was doing. And it just was the perfect show. Thank you. It was the, the perfect, perfect show. It is and it was the perfect show. Yeah. And I see that you had the opportunity. I've been working on you for the past week. So uh, I, I know a little bit about you. So you had the opportunity to kind of switch roles and play mm. your snobby in Maryland, right? At the regional theater. Yeah. My boy, Marco Santana, who did the Broadway run with us, he directed yeah. it. Uh, what was that like? What was that like to, to play the, the father figure? So cool. I mean, I, I mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm usually the kind of actor that never does the same show twice. So I, I typically have an easy time seeing things, seeing a new show. I got, like I've seen In the Heights many times. And I, I actually don't have any issues with the liberties people take. Like I, when I see the show, I'm seeing it as if it were the first time. Mm -hmm. The only thing that reminds me that I was in the show is that in act two, Sonny's emotions always end up, <laughs> I find them around here somewhere during sure. Carnaval. Um, but that experience was really, really cool because it was another show, but I'm doing it with these faces that I, that I did do the Broadway show with some of them. And I'm in this other character. And so, I'm like, oh, I'm on this side of the scenes now. And it was really stimulating and fun. It was also strangely easy. And, and, and I don't mean to say that it's not work because the show is very much hard work, but easy because by that period, I had already started to develop uh, this issue with perfectionism that I discussed earlier. And with that show, I knew it so well that I could just breathe in it. I felt so relaxed from day one. You can hear a dog barking, I apologize. No and, and I was also so proud to see my friend Marcos become an amazing director. Mm -hmm. My Vanessa was Lineri, who's now gonna play Bad Cinderella. Like now she's like the leading lady in, in Andrew. I know exactly who that is. Yeah, 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 good for her. It's so cool, it's totally great for her. So um, and it was also to see the legacy of the show handed down, to see the effect that it's had on black and brown folks in theater, uh, specifically, though, working class black and brown folks. You know, there's there's this thing in theater that happens with black and brown stories oftentimes where it's like the stories tend to cater to an elite white audience that um, where we don't present in any way that's messy. The characters have to be completely noble. And then there's this other thing that happens where we're sort of reduced to just punchlines and stereotypes. But with this, it was like, oh no, we don't, we don't have to play doctors and lawyers to make anyone feel safe. <laughs> uh, we're not violent. We didn't say it doesn't happen in the neighborhood. No. But that's not what we're focusing on. And this is just about everyday struggles for working class folks. And I think that's actually the thing that makes the show even more special in terms of like, uh, in terms of the people that it represents. I completely agree. We are running. I, uh, there are so much to talk to you about, but I want to talk a little bit about um, boys in the band. Um, obviously that um, Mart wrote that in 1968. Mm -hmm. And then you guys did um, a production of it. Um, 50 years later. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, that show had never been on Broadway, which amazes me. I mean, there have been so many revivals of that show off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway and regionally, but that show had never come to Broadway. Those words, yeah. you know. And that, to me, I, I just couldn't believe it. And then I, I remember coming to see the show and... Um, you say you were struggling with that, but Robin, I did not see that. What I saw was a full fleshed out um, person. And he, Emerson, was just the light of that show. He just let it all hang out. Thank you. Th thank you, because I did get to a better place with that show 
and with that character, I think it just, and this is not to pat myself on the back. It's actually, no. I'm, I, I want to comment on, you know, privileges being turned into burdens sure. sometimes in the yeah, creative of course. process. Because that character is so well written, Emery, and I knew everything was on the page. Um, but I'm also like, like, all like most actors. I love my characters, and I want to advocate for them, and I want them to be as human as possible. I don't want them to be reduced. Um, um, I, I don't. I have no problem being laughed at. I have a problem though with my character only being laughed at. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have a little bit of an issue with my character being laughed at, actually. I do. I think there are certain situations okay. where it's not appropriate. And with that character, that often happens. Um, I think I just became so obsessed with respecting Emery and making mm -hmm. sure that he had integrity yeah. that then I just started creating drama and, like, all this other stuff that made me feel sort of unstable in the development of, of the character. But yes. then something happened later on where I knew. I, I knew that he was there and that it was fine. And all I had to do was just my job, show up, do the thing. And I knew, I knew what the map was once the show started and I was going to follow that route. And I reserved the right to change my mind. If that night something else showed itself, another, right. another path revealed itself, you know? Um, but you seem, you seem like you love that. Yeah. You seem that you love when a wrench is thrown in and you have to focus in on telling your story, but you love that live, somebody throws something up there and you have to navigate your way through it. I mean, that oh. is live theater and you, you know, you light up when you talk about that. It, it, it's the most, it's the most exciting part of it. It's where the exchange is most apparent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's also, it happens because you're present. And yeah. as someone who in his personal life has had moments where he struggled to be present, um, you know, theater is the one place where it tends to be easier for me to be present. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this thing that I experience that I'm sometimes trying to create in my actual, actual life. Um, and, and that, that that stimulation I is also because it is that exchanges with the divine. It's a message being delivered. It's like, oh, guess what? You thought you knew what the scene was. You thought you knew what was going to happen with this other actor, with this audience. And guess what? This other thing yes, shows again. up. Right. That, that's why I love uh, in previews, there's always the unavoidable um, first quiet audience. And I love it. I love <laughs> when we get... What some people label as like a crappy audience. Right. I'm all about it. You love it. Love it. I mean, they paid and my check clears, you know? <laughs> I'm going to make a game out of it. To me, <laughs> though, Emery, uh, you know, the sass and the attitude obviously are right on the page. But to me, he just, he just was, he was not afraid to have a feminine side and doesn't take pains to, dull his flame out in any way. There's no apologies. And the relationship, again, that you created with Michael, again, a beautiful kind of heart-to-heart, -heart, beautiful friendship that you can see. I love Michael Washington. I think he's a magnificent actor. So when you have two men that wear their hearts on their sleeves right there, it was, their relationship was just, a beautiful thing to watch. Wait, do you mean uh, um, Jonathan and Michael in Tick Tick? No, I'm sorry. I'm talking about um, Boys in the Band. You oh, and Michael, Michael yeah, Benjamin. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, the Michael Benjamin Washington oh. relationship is I love because I always call Michael Benjamin Michael Benjamin. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. why I was confused. Um, sorry. Yeah. No, no, not at all. No need to be sorry. That was the most exciting aspect of the story for me. Yeah. I um, you know, with, with with Emery, I knew that all that flash and sass and that thing that often is what led to his reduction and what, what often leads to the violence that he experienced yes. in my version was also very much a survival mechanism. It was, I actually don't know how to be butch. I can't fake it. I can't slide by. I'm, I'm, everyone knows I present the way I present. And because of that, I'm gonna turn this thing into art. I'm a fucking right. artist. I'm a creative and I'm gonna give you all the sass and flash. And it's, I am here to entertain you. 
Um, so if anything, he wore that as a badge of honor. It was a pride. And I, and I sure think did. maybe it was a little easier. Maybe, maybe I think for me, I know for me, it was easy to find that right away because I come from a very proud Puerto Rican heritage. And so like that pride being so systemic for us, it was like, of, of course, Emery has that. Um, so if anything, that my, my personal identity kind of just affirmed that and allowed me to, to, to show that more. With Michael Benjamin, what was cool was, you know, it's, it's fascinating that now post pandemic, we're having these discussions of uh, anti-blackness in all cultures and the way that white supremacy has infiltrated non-white people yeah, and the way that white supremacy in thought works. And so I thought it was really, really cool to show me I am a quarter black. You know, I'm, I'm, I am an Afro descendant, even though I don't present that way at, mm -hmm. at all. And, and there's a, there are a lot of conversations to have for, about the pigmentocracy, obviously. And so with Michael Benjamin, it was like, oh, how fascinating that now we've gotten to the point where we can discuss colorism within people of color um, and then have this weird thing of like, I'm, I'm so offensive toward him, but yet we also take care of one another. Yes. Like that, that weird messiness and the healing of it and, and, and me realizing, oh, like, I'm making fun of him to make myself feel better. Um, but he's also in, I thought I was above him in this hierarchy only to discover that, no, <laughs> I'm not. That's right. That's an incredible discovery. I love watching characters discover on stage. There's something so incredible about that discovery, which I, acting teachers, when, when I was an actor, like, 400 years ago, you know, they would say, watch babies and watch the way they discover and how incredible that is. And I love watching actors discover on stage. That's so interesting because I love childlike actors. Yeah. Like AKA Robin Williams. Yeah. Who's always a big kid. And maybe always that's a big why. child. Yeah. yeah. And it's about discovery. And when you, it's so interesting when people discover something or, discover something about another character and you watch that process through Emery and Michael's character. It just was a, it was a beautiful production. And I'm so glad that Mart got to win the Tony. Congratulations on your Tony nomination. Very well-deserved, even though I know you say you were in your head, but to us, we did we did not see that. I, I liberated myself by the end, so it's oh all okay. Good. So yeah. I'm so glad. Um, I want to talk. You know, um, this season really is about um, artists and um, their advocacy. And before we run out of time, I want to get to this, and I want to get to Tick Tick Boom. But um, talk to me a little bit about um, the Cody Renard Richard Scholarship. Yeah, the the Cody Renard Richard Scholarship. I I just want to be really honest with y'all Cody's one of my best friends so obviously I'm gonna pimp him out but also it's an amazing cause so Cody Cody started a scholarship uh that's backed by the Broadway Advocacy Coalition the AC uh for black and brown folks in the arts non-actors you know in, in all of these conversations actors tend to be the most they are the most centered folks in the conversations but but really the changes the more important thing is for the changes to happen <laughs> on the creative side and backstage and producers and stuff. And so Cody's scholarship is to highlight non-actors, uh, stage managers, directors, uh, tech folks, set designers. Um, it gives them uh, money while they're in school or before they go to college. Um, you get a direct line to Cody where you meet with him about five times for workshops and symposiums. You get to meet other leaders in the community uh, along with the money and you being able to help yourself. It's also about creating people in the arts who do advocate and who are community oriented. And you create this network within these folks who all kind of have a similar mission statement. Uh, because right now with the changes that we want on Broadway, it, it has to be grassroots, you know? for it to be the real systemic change that we want. Or I, I should say, it doesn't have to be, but I think maybe for now it does. 
I and so totally, totally agree with you. And I also think that that networking part is something that young actors don't can't grasp when they're just out of school. So this sounds like such a fascinating and a great opportunity for the for young people to to be pushed into or you know welcomed into a network of people that that can answer questions that can help them get from A to B and and it's money access yeah. mentorship it's yeah. money access mentorship and sh shaping these people's minds mm. because we, yeah. we are in a business that is about me 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 and 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 we've accepted it's especially amongst actors, but also I think amongst people backstage too, that you're always out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so what I love specifically about this, about this scholarship, that it operates from a we place and that it is about cultivating that we so that it can, o it can only grow. That's beautiful. That's incredible. I'm so glad you're, and then there's, an, there's another cause that you stand behind as well. Yes. Do you, um, you want to mention it? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, there's the Kip, the Kips Bay Boys and Girls Club. Kips Bay is the boys is yeah. uh in the Bronx. Yeah. And I'm specifically highlighting the Kips Bay Boys and Girls Club because I do like to think locally. It's um it's the Boys and Girls Club that gave my best friend Dominic Olong um uh, a life in the arts. Mm -hmm. Um, it is the Boys and Girls Club that gave us Kerry Washington, Jennifer Lopez. Uh, Veronica Jackson, who's Chris Jackson's wife and is also an amazing singer. And um, it, it's, it's a very special place to me. I've, I've, I've met the kids there several times and I've gone to several events there. But if, if, if you can and have it in your heart to donate to the Kips Bay Boys and Girls Club, um, I would love that. But also if you can, in the special notes, write down that it's for the arts program okay. or the um, Be Bold uh, is a new dance program. Okay. That um, um, Misty Copeland oh. is working with the kids there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yes. Be bold program. And um, yeah, that's it. All right. Great. So we're going to put these up. These are up on, on the uh, YouTube thing now. And we'll put it up on our website as well. So people can, can donate or find out how to volunteer. I mean, there's so many ways to give back to the community and to help besides just reaching in your pocket and, and donating money. I mean, there are so many ways to volunteer. 100%. You know, I want to end with this because um, this movie hit me hard. Tick, tick, boom. Um, besides, I think, in my opinion, I think it is your most extraordinary piece of work on film. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's so interesting, you know, 30 minutes ago, we were talking about where you were, but I, I didn't see that. For me, this movie was about a love story between a straight man and a gay man. And uh, yeah, he had his girlfriend and that's all very interesting. And, and the music and, you know, there's so many beautiful parts of this movie, but your relationship, um, to me, that's, that's what the movie was about. I agree. <laughs> no, about that last part. About that last part. Not about what you said about me. Although I do think it is, personally, it is, I do think it is my best film work. And I think the reason I feel very comfortable saying that is because, of course, it was my best work. I healed myself. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was the piece where something was happening in me. And I, and, you know, I specifically said to myself, oh, my ego is in conflict with, with my love. And literally one of my first lines in the script is, what are you choosing, fear or love? Mm -hmm. And so I didn't even clock that the message of the movie was what I was experiencing in real time. And so whatever that insecurity was and that doubt was actually just the process that I was supposed to be going through. Mm -hmm. It was the themes okay. that were happening in the story. And I confused that inner conflict with actual conflict, meaning that all that I was feeling was the story. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, there was Robin stuff from before, but I right. think I just mislabeled things and I was confused. And, and once that day happened where Biden was announced, I mean, it was like night and day how I felt on that set. Mm -hmm. 
And and I'll never forget the day that we shot the street scene between me and Andrew arguing, arguing. And like that was the day where I physically felt spirit. Like my I kept I kept like getting the shivers because I felt something in there. In, See, in I read that you prayed to Jonathan and you were like, yo boy. I'm trying to get the, 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 the those words like, don't come oh, out dude, of me. You want this to be good? Right. Like you got to show up. Yeah, you got to please show up for me. And yes. you you finish. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, no, it, it 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 that. So the 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 night that the shutdown happened, the next day we were supposed to shoot that scene. Oh. And the first dialogue scene that I shot was the status reveal with Andrew which is towards the end. And right. emotionally, I didn't feel right about doing that scene that day. But what I also knew was that all of my friends who have sh disclosed their status with other friends, instead of being met with, oh my God, what do you need? I'm so sorry, let me take care of you, whatever that is. They've been met with a person who falls apart. And they, as the, as the person revealing their status, now has to become caretaker. And that's often the, the pattern for folks who are HIV positive. And right. so I, I knew that beforehand, but for whatever reason, when I read that scene, I thought, oh, this is the Oscar scene. This is where you're supposed to cry <laughs> and you, the awards come at you, boo-boo. So I got there that day and I wasn't feeling the emotion. And that's right. something for me that's not usually a struggle. I'm a very emotionally well available person. So if anything, I usually have to be told like, pull back, boo-boo, because it's a little, it's, it's, it's just like- much. Yeah, too much. And so that day I, I just, I doubted myself and I thought, well, the, I'm going to do this scene the way I initially thought it should be, which is I'm struggling or I'm at work. He's the one that I'm always taking care of. And in this moment, I can't have him fall apart at work. So I'm going to take care of him. And I ran with that because that's, that was my gut instinct from jump. Right. But my ego wanted an Oscar. Um, <laughs> and then, you know what I'm saying? I understand then, that. Yeah. Yeah. And so then- Or at least um, a Golden Globe, right. It, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, one of and the so, two. And so then when the shutdown happened, I, I had felt so prepared for that scene yeah. that then I had months to just think about how bad I'd fail at it, at the so scene. It, it the was scene. like, what was it? So you, what were they shut down in what, November or March? You we shut, shut down, down in March and we- In March and you came back in November, right? We, I shot that scene in November. Yeah, yeah. You had all of that time. So when you got on set, you were freaking ready for that scene. And re and re remember, I didn't have the aha moment until we came back from the pandemic. Right. We had already shot two weeks, you know, with the with the with the other version of Robin. Um. But with, but but I knew because of the way I ended up doing the scene with Andrew in the office. I knew that the scene in the street had to play a certain way for the emotional build to be, to calibrate the way I wanted it to. Right. And so I just put a lot of pressure on it. But thankfully, that, that aha moment had happened prior to shooting the street scene. But I also knew that like I had built up this scene. So maybe that was the day where I would be triggered and mm -hmm. go backwards a little bit. So I spent the day in deep meditation, talking to Jonathan you know, really talking about what I wanted to do, telling him, like, I want to make sure that I'm respecting the story that you want to tell and not making this about me because that is obviously what I'm doing right now. And so I want to be liberated so that mm -hmm. your story is coming through and also so that my ancestors can come through because one of the major discussions I have with Dominic is that as queer as queer brown folks, um, our elders, we lost our role models. We sure did. You know, we lost so many folks to the to the HIV epidemic, to the AIDS epidemic, and also to the crack epidemic. And when you look at HIV stories, they're oftentimes, they're mostly white gay male stories. You know, the women have been left out as well. And, and so- Well, let's go back. I mean, it's mostly, the, the stories are told about white gay men. Yes. <laughs> Yep. I mean, I'll just say it. You know what I yeah. mean? I mean, and they left out the women um, and every other race. It's just when the stories are told, it's about the white men. 100%. Exactly. And um, I just, I realized that for so many years, so many of us black and brown queer folks, 
have sort of been, we've been figuring it out. Figuring it out and not identifying that we haven't had elders. That for some of us, we haven't had elders. Like nothing's been modeled for us because a generation literally died and then they weren't really documented in media in a way for all of us to see. So we've just been sort of feeling like we're figuring things out and you're you out know, there on your own. There were no, yeah. there were no one to look up to. Right. And with the show being a period piece. Yeah. And, and also, you know, it, this would have landed more maybe if I was like a darker hue, cause I am a light skinned Latino. Um, but I, I just wanted to make sure that my ancestors were represented and that they were placed back through this period piece into that timeline so that they could finally be acknowledged. You're absolutely right. And you did that. You did that. And I never thought of it as a period piece, but you're absolutely a hundred percent right. I have one last question. Um, what is your hope Robin as an, a Latino artist what is the legacy that that you want to leave? What is it that, yeah, what is the legacy that you want to leave as an artist? Um, I don't like legacy, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> well, no, no, the reason I say that is because That's sometimes okay. sometimes legacy gets weighty and and it it, it can be like, I want to be remembered for this and like, I'm going to be dead. I'm going to take the question back. What is yes. your hope? What is your hope? for yourself and for our theater community for the near future? Um, my personal hope is that I get to participate in a collective change yeah. within all of us as a community that helps us heal, that helps us become better storytellers, that helps us become storytellers um, who care about our audiences all audiences, not just folks that can pay $200 per ticket. 200, Oof, right. Yeah, yeah. and so I, I, I hope that we just better, storytelling is such an important part to our culture and so much of our history lives through in it. And right. I wanna make sure that our history is better told. Put perfectly. And I also think that um, within the movie, you know, Jonathan says, live for today. Don't think about yesterday and the future. You gotta live in the moment today, which when you do, you Robin DeJesus. Yeah. Thank you. And when you live in today, and when you heal in today, yeah, you are also healing retroactively those that have gone, and you are healing for those in the future. So, you know, it's that it's that awareness that that when you get the privilege of of healing yourself, it only multiplies. Oh, a perfect way to end it. Robin, you have been a joy. Uh, it is such a privilege and an honor to see you again and to talk to you and to, it was such a beautiful hour. Thank you so much for your time, your artistry and your craft. I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Um, that's our show, ladies and gentlemen. For our next show, which will be recorded on November 14th, uh, Joy DeMichelle and I will interview award-winning writer Larissa Fasthorse. Larissa is a MacArthur Fellow and author of the hit comedy The Thanksgiving Play, which is one of the top 10 most produced plays in America. She is the first Native American playwright in history on that list. We will talk about that show, scheduled to open on Broadway, <clears throat> in the spring of 2023 and her other works. Then on December 5th, my friend Warren Carlyle will be our guest. Warren is an Emmy and four-time Tony nominee, as well as a Tony Drama Desk Outer Critics Circle winner. His Broadway directing credits include After Midnight, for which he won a Tony, Chaplin, and Hugh Jackman back on Broadway. His Broadway choreography credits include The Music Man, Kiss Me Kate, and Hello Dolly. I look forward to speaking with him about all these shows, as well as Harmony, which he directed and choreographed off-Broadway last season, and will be coming to Broadway very soon. More information about these and future guests, as well as how to attend our recordings online, can be found on our website, liveatthelortel.com. Thank you for joining us tonight. Stay healthy, and make sure to check out Robin and welcome to Chippendales on Hulu, season one. 
Don't forget, he's not on until season three, so you can skip one and two, but you can watch him after. Robin De- yeah, Robin De Jesus, you're my idol. Thank you so much for your time and your beautiful work. Um, I think you're going to leave quite a legacy, and I love your hope for what's around. So thank you. Yeah. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you really soon. Stay safe.